Okay, are you ready for something that's not CDC, Ebby or Debbie? <laughs> Uh, the committee actually was introduced to uh, an intervention that's uh, more locally grown, you could say, um, and it's called Think Twice. It's an individual level, single session, peer delivered intervention for men who have sex with men. And the intervention um, focuses primarily around commonly used grassroots form of prevention called zero sorting. You heard a little bit about zero sorting in some earlier presentations today. Basically what zero sorting is is limiting partners to those of your same status. So positive people looking for positive partners, negative people looking for negative partners. Um, the intervention uses a graphic novel to deliver the intervention content and you'll see what that is in just a minute. Some theory and evidence. Think Twice is a theory-based um, behavioral intervention, and I'm going to let Lisa talk to you more about that. Um, it was tested among both white and African-American men who have sex with men. And the short-term outcomes demonstrated substantial reductions in numbers of sexual partners um, among participants. So what I'm going to do now is um, uh, ask... Uh, Dr. Lisa Eaton, she's a postdoctoral fellow at CIRA, to come up and talk to you about um, Think Twice. She worked on the design and the study of Think Twice um, with uh, UConn psychologist Seth Kalishman, who many of us are familiar with, um, as he developed the Debbie um, Healthy Relationships that many of us implement. Um, so I'd like to welcome Lisa. Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm happy you are all here, and I'm really excited for the great turnout. Um, so yeah, and thank you for the introduction. That was kind of my whole talk, but <laughs> it's cool. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. But um, no, no. So I, I hope not, because I... <laughs> I do have about 18 slides. So anyways, the title of the talk is The Development and Outcomes of an Intervention to Address Serosorting Among HIV-Negative Men Who Have Sex with Men. And I don't, just for the record, I don't like the term MSM either, but we end up kind of sticking to it because we know that we have men in our study who say that they are straight and they are definitely having unprotected sex with other men. So, um, so that's what happens. Uh, okay. So, as I'm sure you're all familiar, the um, incident HIV level has been rising. And, and the last time it was estimated, it was about 56,000 incident infections. And of course, uh, men who have sex with men are disproportionately affected by HIV. Um, they make up about half of all new infections. And some estimates vary, but somewhere between 2 to 5% of the male population. So, clearly sharing a huge burden of incident HIV infections. So what exactly is going on? So what are MSM doing that's placing themselves at risk for HIV infection? Well, in looking at the literature on it, we know that MSM are continually, continuing to engage in high rates of unprotected sex. Okay. And what are some determinants of these unprotected sex acts? Well, some things that we see over and over again in the literature and feedback that we get from um, focus groups are things like safer sex fatigue, HIV treatment optimism. There's a lot coming out on that in the past few years. So people just thinking that HIV is more of a chronic illness and that medications for HIV are really good um, and that you can be HIV, you know, you can be chronically infected and be on medication and, and lead a normal life. Um, and then substance use, as I mean, HIV prevention since the very beginning of the epidemic. That's something that's come up over and over again. Okay, but one thing I'm going to focus on in particular is serosorting. So as mentioned, serosorting is limiting unprotected um, sexual partners to those who are of the same HIV status. Okay, so HIV positive men having sex with HIV positive men, HIV negative men having um, unprotected sex with HIV negative men. And this strategy um, is, is actually commonly reported among MSM when, when we um, survey them on it. 
And it's really a grassroots form of prevention. So although sorting has only more recently been looked at in the literature, say like in the past about five years or so, we can document that it's been going on since the beginning of the epidemic as well. There have been um, sex parties for HIV positive men since like mid 80s. Okay, so it's been going on for a while, but we're really just starting to focus on it now and what it mean what it means to men and and what it means in terms of from a public health standpoint. Um, and essentially, it's an alternative to condom use. So if you're only having sex with people of the same HIV status, in theory, you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Well, the problem is, is that in practice, we know it's risky. How do we know it's risky? So <clears throat> in studies looking at men who are not just recently diagnosed, but recently HIV infected, when we ask them, when we say to them, okay, well, tell me what you've done for the past few months in terms of what behaviors have you engaged in, many of them, their greatest risk for HIV infection is reporting sex with a man who they thought was HIV negative. Okay. So we, so we know based on that data. And then there's also more recent longitudinal data um, coming out looking at men who always use condoms, men who sarasaur, and men who have unprotected sex with HIV positive and HIV negative partners. And those men who sarasaur they're, they're also, some of them are also um, seroconverting as well. So, and then there's, um, it, it's not, there's a modeling study, the interesting modeling study of serosorting. It's not exactly a comprehensive model of serosorting, but it brings up some really important points. So just bear with me for this one because it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. So, it, so in this particular modeling study by Butler and Smith, what they found was that for for a man who's HIV negative, it's actually um, riskier for that man to have unprotected sex with um, a man who's believed to be HIV negative from a higher risk population than it is for that man to have unprotected sex with a man who's HIV positive and on treatment. And the reason for that is this. If you're HIV positive and you're on treatment, um, you're it's likely that your viral load is under control and therefore you're less infectious. Whereas if you select a man who's believed to be HIV negative from a higher risk population, there's a chance that they're acutely infected. They're acutely HIV infected. And they don't know that, okay? Because standard tests don't, don't um, detect that. And if you're acutely infected, then you're, you have a high viral load because you don't have an immunological response. So um, you're also hot, more infectious. Okay, so it gets a little bit complicated, but that for sure is undermining serosorting, that, that type of scenario. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, and really at the center of serosorting, is that you have to have accurate information about your own and your partner's HIV statuses. And this is very difficult information to ascertain. So one thing that one thing to look at, of course, is HIV testing. In our own studies looking at men who report serosorting, what we found is that they, um, on average, their last HIV test was 14 months ago, and they've reported four sexual partners in the past six months. Okay, so they're serosorting, they're relying on this test result from 14 months ago, and they've had a lot of sex. They've had a lot of different partners um, in that time frame. So that information is not accurate, right? And, um, <clears throat> and essentially, even if you test, let's say, you know, even if you test often, it, you can really never test often enough for HIV to be certain of your status if you're engaging in high-risk behavior because of acute infection, right? So either way, um, it, it te HIV testing really isn't a form of prevention in terms of relying on the information to um, reduce the likelihood of being HIV infected. And then also, one thing that serosorting, serosorting for HIV infection at least, one thing it doesn't consider is other sexually transmitted infections. So if you're not taking into consideration things like gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, herpes, all these other potential infections, the problem with that is that in the presence of those infections, you can be more infectious and also more likely to be infected if you have an in, um, inactive infection, okay? So that also undermines serosorting. 
Okay, so what can we do to address some of the risk of seroserting? Well, one thing we know is that risk reduction counseling is effective. So, and there are two important components of sexual risk reduction counseling that are even more critical when um, designing a serosorting intervention. One of which is tailoring to the individual, and the other, um, which I'll get, I'll get into greater detail on, and the other is feasibility. So we, we all know that this has to be feasible given the tools that we have and the setting that it's going to be done in. Um, in one form of sexual risk reduction counseling is a single session intervention, and, and it's kind of a, something that I focused on a lot because to me these are much more feasible than a multi-session intervention when you're trying to get people to come back multiple times and so on and so forth, um, and also because they can fit into existing healthcare infrastructure more easily than a more complicated intervention. And so a single session intervention is exactly what it says it is. It's one contact with a client or one contact with a participant. And um, in a review of these studies, we found that the evidence for effectiveness of a single session intervention is actually comparable to the evidence for the effectiveness for a multi-session intervention. So it's really good news. <clears throat> And also, single session interventions have been demonstrated to reduce risk behavior, not only risk behavior, but um, biological outcomes. So looking at sexually transmitted infections, we see a decrease as a result of having gone through a single session intervention. And uh, as I had mentioned, these, they're a potentially a reasonable option for healthcare setting, okay? Because not only are they a minimal burden, but they are more likely to be able to fit into the existing services that are already being provided. Okay, so what would a serosorting intervention look like? Um, so now I'm going to get into more of the details on Think Twice. So Think Twice is a single session, one-on-one, -on -one, peer counselor-delivered brief intervention. It's about 40 minutes. And... Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I'll talk a little bit first about the recruiting for the for this intervention that we did. Um, we went to we we engaged in active recruitment, um, and we used various forms. So we went into bars, we went into parks, um, we went into treatment centers, we went into other organizations that were providing services. We um, sent out flyer. We just covered this. This study was actually done in Atlanta, so yeah, it was it was guided by people in. In Connecticut, but was done in Atlanta, but um, it was done in both rural and urban areas of Atlanta, and we had success with with both of those settings. Um, <clears throat> for the more rural areas, we did we had people call us. We sent out flyers to everywhere we could. We thought that people would um, congregate, and they they called us in um, to be screened over the phone, and then. For the more urban areas, so of course, that's when we did the active recruitment at the bars and so on and so forth. And as has been mentioned, you really need people who are engaging and they're fun and they have um, <clears throat> a lot of good energy because in, in a sense, you're not only trying to get people to buy into the intervention, but initially you're trying to get people to buy into the person, the person who's presenting the information. Um, <clears throat> and let's see. So what we found was that we probably, in the course of maybe two or three months, we had about two or three recruiters working at any given time, and we must have um, we must have contacted a few thousand people. So we were really able to cover a lot of ground, um, and. We also use the internet as well. So we found that Craigslist was really effective. It's about $25 to post, um, to, to make a posting for, um, you can put it in the employment section of Craigslist and then you can give all the details of, of a study and, and that, that, was, um, that was very useful. And we also use Adam for Adam and manhunt.com to maintain those profiles. Um, and another thing is what we did is we actually hooked up with club promoters, bar owners, people who are really in the know of what's going on in the night scene, and that was very, very in effective in terms of getting us a foot in the door. Um, <clears throat> so the Think, the think Twice intervention itself, now I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So <clears throat> um, Think Twice, really the focus of it is mainly on providing information about serosorting, about selecting sexual partners, and also coming up with a real world doable plan. Um, so 
and we there's there's minimal materials. There's a graphic novel that we created for the story or <clears throat> for the intervention, and this actually was a very effective way of being able to talk about um, <clears throat> personal things about people's sexual lives, in uh, all while you're trying to build rapport as well because you got a short amount of time and you're trying to pack a lot of information into it. So what we did is we used a fictional char character, though the story is evidence based. It's the story of Mike and he in the beginning of the graphic novel, he tests HIV negative. And he uses things like serosorting and strategic positioning and questions about viral load, some of the things that have been mentioned earlier, to stay safe. And um, but at the end of the story, he he ends up testing HIV positive, and the, <clears throat> what the counselor does with the um, with the client or with the participant is works their way from the end of the story to the beginning of the story, talking about the ways uh, Mike potentially uh, put himself at risk for HIV infection, and then of course it's possible that he was acutely infected at the beginning of the story when he tested HIV negative. So all these things about serosorting <clears throat> and these other um, strategies that men are using can be mentioned just by going through this graphic novel. And then <clears throat> there's something interesting that happens during the intervention. So you say to the men, once you've gone through the story and, and talked about these different strategies and how they're effective or, or ineffective, you say to them, okay, well, how did you relate to Mike? Do you relate to Mike at all, the lead character of the story? And they would always say, no, 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 I don't relate to him. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, and so then we work, we have a, a feedback, kind of like a, a feedback report that we work through. It's, it's very short. It's, it's about three pages. And we say, okay, well, let's talk about you and tell me, tell me about the partners that you've had in, in the past um, six months or in the past year. And let's talk about what you did with those partners and what their status was and you know, when they were tested and what position you were in. I mean, the whole sh shebang. Okay. <laughs> And then they would kind of say, oh, yeah, I get it. I am Mike. I do get it now. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so we, I, I mean, I refer to it as a teachable moment. It's kind of like where you've, you know, turned the light on in, in somebody's mind and got them really thinking about what they've been doing, what they've been putting, what they've been doing to put themselves at risk. And... Um, and then we say, and, and then the point is to come up with a real world reasonable plan. And that's, that's really where the theory of the intervention um, comes in, which is conflict theory of decision making. So <clears throat> we've really bought into this idea of informed decision making. All right. So you're going to give, I mean, the idea is to give men <clears throat> all the information, give men the facts about what's going on, and then let them use the facts to come up with their own plan for what's going to work, what's going to work for them. Um, <clears throat> and according to conflict theory of decision making, what happens is, is that you get both, um, <clears throat> the idea is to take all the different behaviors you've been engaging in, all the things you want to do, all the things you're worried about, um, all, all the ways in which you're worried about placing yourself at risk, work through those things to come up with a plan that you can not only be happy with, but also feel comfortable with. Okay. And we really, the goal is to really get the, the client to buy into it. All right. Um, <clears throat> And the hope is, is that it, it, will, it will eventually result in the best decision for them. Um, and here's just a simple kind of conceptual model of what I mean when I'm talking about this informed decision making. So as I, as I mentioned, it, it's taking kind of like all these social cognitive factors that go on when, when um, selecting sexual partners and weighing the costs and the benefits associated um, <clears throat> and reviewing all these decisions and then making a final decision. So just, just a few details on the actual testing of the intervention itself. We had about 150 people in this intervention. And I'll just say that these men were screened for um, for sexual risk behavior. So these men had reported um, two unprotected anal sex partners in the past six months, and you can see they're um, they're about in their late twenties, some college. Um, there is a considerable amount of drug and alcohol use in this particular population. They're mostly African American and white. 
And about half had reported ever having an STD, which is just fairly high. So they're 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 a higher risk population, um, and this is the main the main outcome from the intervention. So this is the number of uh, male sexual partners, and you can see at the at the. Um, <clears throat> To the left at the baseline, they reported on average um, about four sexual partners for both the, the intervention and the control group. And then at one month, you see a decrease in the number of sexual partners being reported among men who went through the Think Twice intervention. And then uh, you see the, the same decrease at the three-month mark as well. So it's shown to be effective in terms of reducing the number of partners at, at short-term outcomes. Um, <clears throat> So essentially, um, when I mentioned, I had talked a bit about feasibility of, inter of an intervention. The idea for Think Twice, it was really designed around being able to incorporate it during routine HIV testing and counseling. So I know right now um, many of you are using the, the CDC-based guidelines for testing and counseling. Well, this could be used as a form of post-test counseling. So for men who test HIV negative, and if you're wondering about HIV positive men, I've I can talk about that as well, but just just for this um, talk, I'm just talking about HIV negative men. Um, so if you so if you test HIV negative, <clears throat> this intervention is designed to be given as as a post test form of counseling. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then essentially just in, in some, we know that blanketed messages for risk reduction are not sufficient. More and more we're seeing that informed decision making is, is really um, a more effective form of coming up with a risk reduction plan because it not only allows for making educated decisions, but it also prepares men for when they're in a situation where they're at risk and they need tools and skills to reduce the risk that they're facing. So that's it.